All right. Well, it is uh, it is five o'clock on the west coast of Canada. So welcome everyone to um, to the February edition of the Vancouver Power BI and Modern Excel User Group Meetup. Uh, we will be getting started with the feature presentation shortly, which is uh, our. Uh, our, our awesome um, What's New speaker, Joseph, that does every one of our What's News for us, or at least most of them. Uh, so, um, but yeah, that's coming up in a bit. So let's uh, let's go through and uh, and do the uh, the normal normal here of the thanks to our sponsors here. So I just want to throw out a big thanks to uh, Skillwave, obviously my uh, training uh, division of Excel Guru that uh, that goes and provides some uh, some awesome Excel and Power BI content, along with my partner Matt Ellington. Um, I've actually spent uh, all day working on the refresh of some of my Power BI content for the self-service BI bootcamp and uh, wish I was further through it, but hey, that is what it is. Um, also, I just want to throw out a, a quick acknowledgement to uh, Monkey Tools, which is the software that I build to help you build better data models faster. And um, if you haven't checked it out, you should definitely do that. It has its own website uh, for that purpose. Uh, our next meetup is coming up. Um, just a quick note on both of these meetups. Note they have different dates and times from our normal slots that we usually do. Normally we're, you know, this time on a Thursday evening. Um, our Excel track is going to be on Thursday, March 9th. So it's still a Thursday, but it's going to be at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So about four hours earlier. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're bringing in for a uh, shake and he's coming to us all the way live from Dubai. Um, so we uh, we need to make sure that the time frame is uh, conducive for him. So he's going to be talking about report automation with Office Scripts and Power Automate. And then in uh, later on in March, on the 27th, that's going to be a Monday. We're going to do the regular start time, but on a different day. Uh, Jason Cockington is going to be joining us from uh, Sydney, Australia. And he's going to be uh, giving a presentation on how to show or hide a Power BI visual based on selection. Uh, if you don't know Jason, uh, Jason actually uh, works with Matt Allington um, in there. Uh, he's one of actually Matt's trainers that uh, trains people on Power BI as well. So be a great opportunity to, uh, to meet him um, in the community here as well. Uh, of course, uh, as always, um, we always get the question on uh, on Meetup, but uh, just to let people know that we definitely do record all of these things uh, and they will be posted up usually within 24 to 48 hours, depending on what I have on my schedule. Um, but uh, they are always hosted on the Skillwave YouTube channel and we will post on the Meetup site once those recordings are ready so that you know where to find them. Uh, hang on a second. I just lost my clicky clicky here. Uh, there we go. Um, another quick one I want to throw out there. Uh, I haven't had the chance to put on any new monkey shorts, but uh, if you're interested in checking out some quick bite-sized playlists on some uh, some good tips around how to work with Power Query, Power Pivot, Power BI, and whatnot, you should check out our monkey shorts playlist. Each of the content sections of these videos is less than three minutes, so they're quick hits of good information. Um, we've got uh, a few from last year. We're going to start to just you know sort of letting you know here. It's a good time to relive some of these uh, one click refresh power query based pivot tables um, is, is one of my favorite little tips that we actually had there so it's a few different tips there you can check them all out at our skill wave youtube channel at the url shown here and of course this deck is already posted at the meetup site so you can get all these links quite easily the last thing I'm going to throw out here is if you would like to be part of our Vancouver Power BI user group, speak about Excel or Power BI or anything in the Power Platform, we would love to have you. We love welcoming new speakers to our channel. Just fill out the, uh, the survey here. We will get in touch with you and get you on our stage. And that's it for me, man. Are you ready for costume change number one, Joseph? Let me come off mute. Yeah. yeah <laughs> All um, right. Yeah, let's jump Good into stuff. the what's new. All right. So yeah. So uh, so the way this is uh, is going to work for us uh, tonight here, Joseph is not only doing the what's new in Power BI for this month, but he's going to be following it up after a quick costume change, apparently, uh, with his presentation <laughs> <laughs> for a feature length presentation on the Power BI mixtape. So um, I'm just going to well, I'm going to stop talking and and let you uh, let you dive into this one. So the floor is yours, my friend. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Thank thanks, Ken, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so 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 as Ken just said, I'm uh, my name's Joseph. I usually do the what's new in Power BI every month, and this month I'm going to do the feature presentation as well. So I'll start with um, I'll start with what's new in 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 Power BI for for February this month, um, and then won't quite do a costume change, but might uh, reset gears slightly, uh, and then we'll jump into the presentation. Uh, so with 
with every month um, for the new feature release in Power BI, there's an accompanying blog post. So this is actually the first feature release of this year, February 2023. There wasn't one in uh, there wasn't one in January. I don't think there was one in January, or maybe there wasn't one in December. Um, uh, at, at any rate, this was the first sort of uh, more substantial one of the year. Uh, and, and I have to admit, preparing for the feature presentation this week, and as we were getting closer and closer to today, and there hadn't been a feature release, it was kind of like, ooh, okay, maybe I'll only have to do the feature presentation. Uh, but of course, the the February release dropped yesterday. So at least I had a little bit of yesterday evening and, and today to go through and uh, summarize some of my favorite features that I've had about 24 hours or so um, to, to start looking at and playing with. Uh, so, so within within this blog post that gets released, a lot of these new uh, new features are grouped together up here at the top. You can see a list of of all what's new, either in preview or has been made generally available. If it's been in in preview in previous months, uh, they're grouped together into these sections like reporting, analytics, modeling, data connectivity, and so on. Uh, and then a little bit further down, we see that we actually have a full YouTube video. Um, that goes over a few examples for pretty much all of these new features. Um, so I'm only going to pick, I think, three or so from, from this entire list to go over um, before the session today. So if, if you're interested in seeing a different take on those features or, or something on this list catches your eye uh, and you want to see it in action, I would definitely recommend checking out this YouTube video as well. Uh, but for my my first new favorite feature uh, is actually the very first one on the list. Uh, and it says right here in the blog, we know that many of you have been asking for this feature. Uh, and, and that is true. And um, we now have conditional formatting based on string fields in Power BI. So we've previously, and I think I've demoed for, for the what's new, and we'll actually see some conditional formatting a little later on in the session this evening. Uh, we've seen that based on uh, numeric fields but we haven't been able to do conditional formatting based on string fields yet. Uh, however, that has changed. So if I just jump into Power BI here, we'll see what this looks like. So I have a column chart down here in the bottom left-hand corner. And typically, if I want to change the legend for this column chart, I can take something from our data model, I can take a column from our data model, and I can drop it in the legend, as it, for an example, um, within the visual. And now we can see that each of the bars have been colored depending on what um, value the product category column has for these specific rows. Uh, let's just take that out for a second. Uh, but another option we have to determining the color of certain items within our visuals is to use conditional formatting. Uh, and as I said previously, we were only able to do this with a with a numeric field or on a numeric axis. But now if I go to the visualizations tab for this visual and within the columns pane, from this drop down, we can set just the column color for all of for all of the columns. Uh, and the default is this light blue. And if we click this uh, formula, this FX button, we have the option to do some conditional formatting. So if I hit rules, and which field should we base this value on? I'm actually going to choose this product um, from our product dimension, the account product. And this is where this conditional formatting comes in. Previously, we only had aggregations like sum and count and average, but now we have first and we have last as well. Yeah, last, count distinct, count. So we can actually do some aggregations on text fields. Uh, an account product, which we see on our axis, is a text field. So now we have we have the ability to define a rule set if the value of our first product is, and I'm just going to pick loans, then we can set the bar to be pink. And if we add a new rule, if the value is, um, and we don't have to say is, we can say contains or starts with or is empty or is blank, but we'll just stick with is for now. Uh, we'll say deposit. Then let's make this a different color, like the orange maybe. And we'll hit OK. And now we can see that the chart has been updated like that. So we can actually set a specific rule set outside of just using a field in our data model. And we can do this on those text fields now, which is really cool. 
Uh, back to the blog. The my second favorite update from this month are new accessible report themes. So um, there's been a few different releases and updates to report theming over the last probably three, maybe even four years at this point. Um, and we've seen sort of the expansion on, on how we can update the base theme of a report, being able to import custom themes and, and even customizing your theme within Power BI natively without having to use a third party tool. Uh, and now we have some additional more accessible themes as well. So if I jump back into my Power BI report, if I go to the view tab up on the ribbon up here, we see this section to the very left hand side uh, is called themes. And if I hit the drop down, um, always at the top, we can see the current theme of the report. And I'm actually using an accessible theme already, as we can see from the tooltip. Uh, but now in this first section, we have other additional accessible themes for us to use. So I can change the color um, of the report to, to a different accessible theme. And we navigate through and we have a few different options that we can choose from. Uh, I'll just put it back to what it was before. Uh, and in addition to these accessible themes, we also have an entire suite of Power BI themes as well um, that, that aren't accessible, but do have some different color palettes uh, depending on how we want to set up our report. Uh, I'm just going to jump back into the blog for my last favorite update from this month. Uh, and Ken and I sometimes play a game where he likes to try and guess what are my favorite updates from this month. Uh, and I'm sure we haven't actually spoken about it for, for this session, but I'm sure he may have guessed that one of my new favorite updates that I think is really cool is we have a couple of new DAX functions. Uh, we have two new statistical DAX functions, line ST and line STX. And what these functions allow us to do is to perform simple linear regression using DAX within uh, within a Power BI report or or within anywhere we can use the DAX language where this function is available. Um, and there's, there's a there's actually quite a thorough example with, which is which is quite good on the blog here. Um, it does have its own documentation page within the Microsoft documentation for for both of the two functions. I'm going to be using line ST today. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that there, there is an in-depth example already on the blog, as well as a documentation page that's live. Uh, but I'm going to go through an example uh, right now in my demo file. So let's pull this up once again. And I'm going to go into the data view. And we'll see why in a second. Because this, although this is a DAX function, we can't use it as, as a measure or as a calculated column because this function returns a, a table with only one row. So the easiest way to, to see this in action within Power BI is to actually use it to create a calculated table. And, and in fact, calculated tables are something that we may be seeing a little bit later on this evening in the feature session as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna make the formula bar a little bit bigger here. But let's call our new table regression stuff. So I'm going to use the line ST function, and we have two we have two um, arguments. We need to define the, our Y value and our X value. So our Y value is essentially the the column in our data set that we want to try and and predict, and then our X value is the column that we want to use from within the same table of our data set um, that we want to use to try and predict that value. So I'm going to try and predict revenue from my cycle fact table in my data model. And to try and predict revenue, I'm going to use the random cost column from that same table. And I'll hit OK. So now that I've used this to define this um, our calculated table in Power BI, we can see all of the information that this function provides to us. Um, what we're going to be looking at in a little bit more detail just over the next few minutes is this slope, intercept, uh, and this coefficient of determination functions. Um, so slope and intercept can help give us a formula to try and predict revenue. If we think back to algebra in high school, the y equals mx plus b. Um, so m is, is our slope, x is our, is our x variable. 
um, this random cost amount and the plus B is our intercept. So using these two values, we can use that either um, potentially in a calculated column if we wanted to do that. Um, I'm just going to, to create a visual in Power BI um, just to, to visualize what a simple linear regression model looks like. Uh, and then our coefficient of determination, we may also see this as R, as R squared. Um, this is how we can measure how much of the variability in this revenue column random cost amount um, captures in trying to predict it. Uh, we also have some additional columns and additional information about our simple linear regression model. We have like some, some standard errors of our slope and our intercept, the standard error um, or the uh, degrees of freedom and our F statistic rather, um, our residual sum of squares or regression sum of squares, don't have time to get into all of those things today, um, although we were chatting about stats beforehand. So now maybe instead of R and Python, Ken, you can do stats in DAX. Who would have who would have thought that would have been possible? Oh, joy. Um, yeah, that joy. sounds like a heck of a lot of fun. Totally. Um, so I'm just going to populate these these four visuals to wrap up this example. Um, so so from our cycle fact table in the scatter plot here, uh, let's just view hidden. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Um, so revenue is our is what we're trying to predict. It's our Y. So I'm going to put that on our Y axis. Random cost amount is what we're using to to predict revenue. So I'm going to put that on our X axis. Um, date is sort of a de facto primary key for this table, or or at least a unique identifier for this table. Uh, and I've also added a trend line here. Uh, and so if I go to our regression stuff. Um, let's put our intercept in this first card up here and our slope in this one. So when we look at this, this trend line, this is essentially our line of best fit. If we look at our intercept from, from, our, from our DAX function, it's negative 500. And now this gets cut off a little bit in the visual, but let's expand that Y axis to go to negative, let's say negative 1000 like that. Uh, and if that line would continue all the way to the x-axis, it would, or, or to the y-axis rather, it would intercept the y-axis at negative 500. And that's basically saying that when our uh, when when our revenue is is zero, or, or sorry, when our um, when our cost is zero, our revenue is going to be negative uh, is going to be negative 500. Uh, but for every incremental increase in cost our revenue is going to increase by 7.3. So a little bit difficult to see on this scale, but essentially for every additional unit of cost, our revenue increases by 7.3. Um, we can also add our coefficient of determination here. So we can see that when we're trying to predict our revenue, just using random cost, captures about 64% of the variability in revenue, which is actually pretty good. So we can get a pretty good prediction and a pretty good idea of what our cost is going to be, or of what our revenue is going to be rather, just based on what the cost is. Um, having, having the output of our calculated table like this, we can then reference slope and intercept and we can create measures off of these columns and then combine that with other data. Um, not going to spend too much time on this, but I can definitely see myself digging into this a little bit more. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that this is something that will be included and expanded upon in future releases um, as well. So I think with that, I th those are my three favorite updates from this month. Again, make sure to check out the blog, um, check out the YouTube video if there's anything you want to look at more. Uh, and particularly with this regression stuff um, or with this linear regression model uh, function in DAX, uh, maybe by the time you know Power BI Mixtape Volume 2 comes out, part of the session will be on this function because uh, I think it's super cool functionality to bring natively into, into Power BI. And let's not save that. And am I OK just to jump into the presentation, Ken? I mean, unless you feel you need an intermission to break it up, but uh, yeah, I'd say go for it. All right. I'll spin around in my chair or maybe I'll flip my hat backwards or something. 
Um, so, so still me, but welcome to the feature presentation, Power BI Mixtape Volume 1. Um, I, I won't introduce myself again, but I might, uh, let's just close out some of this, uh, close out some of that, uh, what's new stuff. Um, yeah, I won't reintroduce myself, but one thing I didn't go over before is my website, feathersanalytics.com, where I blog about all things Power BI, Power Query, R, uh, Python, DAX, I guess. Uh, and and it's not quite up, it's not up just quite yet, but all the um, example files that I'm going to go over this evening, um, over throughout some of the examples in the presentation, will be up on this presentations uh, section of my website too. Um, so if you want to if you want to go and and look at the files, look through some of the examples that I did, maybe follow along to the recording of the presentation, and that's going to be on the Skillwave YouTube channel. Uh, we can definitely do that. Uh, on this page, we can see a few of the previous presentations that I've done um, for this user group and other user groups as well. And um, so um, just over a year ago, I presented Python integration in Power BI. Um, I've had sessions on financial statements with DAX in Power BI, um, AI in Power BI, um, and then some R presentations as well. Um, so, so a little bit more about me. Um, as I said, I use a lot of different tools. You know, there's SQL Server. I've, I've played a little bit with DBT, Power BI, Tableau, Python, R. Uh, and really, this is to model, manipulate, analyze, and visualize data. Um, currently, I'm a director of the Business Intelligence and Data Analysis Program at Corporate Finance Institute, um, where I build um, courses and do different stuff with, uh, build different types of content. Um, that covers really all the functionality of these different tools of how we can do some of these things with data uh, and, and really drive better decision making um, and helping others that may not have these technical skills and um, to make better decisions by um, creating, curating, communicating insights from data. Uh, so, so that's me. If you do come to, the, if you do attend the user group monthly, you will have seen me present either previously or or with these what's new in Power BI as well. Uh, but enough about me. Let's jump into the session. So, Power BI mixtape volume one. Um, these are my yeah. The, these are some of my contact details. They'll be up at at, uh, at the end of the session as well. But a little bit of an agenda for today. So. Um, We'll spend a little bit of time doing an introduction of, of you know, sort of setting out what we're going to do in the session and, and exactly what all these examples are going to demonstrate. Uh, but we're going to go through three examples today. Uh, we'll look at one that's more focused on Power Query within Power BI, uh, connecting to web data. Then we're going to be looking at an example that's more focused on the data modeling side uh, within, within Power BI. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at a data model with multiple fact tables. Uh, and then for our last example, there is an aspect of data modeling as well, but we're going to be more focused on the DAX in that example. And we're going to see some, uh, some cool tips or tricks maybe for how we can do different types of filtering and highlighting in our report. So this brings us to the introduction. So what the heck is a mixtape? And so, you know, as anyone, I just Google it. Mixtape is a compilation of music, typically from multiple sources, recorded onto a medium. And when I think of mixtape, I think of these cassette tapes. And I had to Google an image of this to bring it up onto, uh, had to bring it up onto the slide. Kind of makes me think of Stranger Things as well. Um, maybe it's just the old tech. Um, but, but, but really, I guess how this presentation came about is, I was I was reflecting over the last um, I think it was a joke I made uh, in the January meetup group actually, and I think this is year year eight maybe of of doing the power the Vancouver Power BI meetup group, and I was just thinking of all the different sessions that that I've attended or the presentations um, that I've shared, and there's there's just been so much cool content and cool little tips and tricks out there. Um, that I really just wanted to have a collection and have a record of some of just my favorite 
solutions that I've that I've seen um, that I've either seen or that I've either put together and may have presented aspects of um, previously as well. And and I guess a, maybe not a disclaimer, but some points to keep in mind as we go through. So so with each of these three examples, all three of these solutions addressed specific problems and a specific requirement set. So there's definitely going to be different and to be honest, probably likely better solutions out there. Um, and as I go through the examples, I'm going to gloss over some of the struggles or some of like the incorrect ways, I guess, that I tried first to address these solutions before just going before I was able to um, you know, break through <laughs> and get to the correct answer. So we're just going to jump straight to the correct answer for the most part as we go through these um, as we go through these examples. Um, and and as I was pulling this together and and this thought of glossing over some of the struggles, I wanted to get some images to uh, to kind of reflect that. And I was looking through PowerPoint and some of the cartoon characters that they now have available, and I thought these kind of have summed up definitely some different stages of development that any, you know, anyone who does any sort of development or, or um, data analysis, I'm, I'm sure has been in one of these three states at least, or potentially in all of these three states as well. Um, yeah, so, 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 so as I say, ju just to keep in mind, not saying that there, this is the only way to achieve this, um, not even saying it's the best way to achieve this, but I think all three of these were able to make it into a production type environment and were performant enough for the scenario that they addressed. Um, and with that, I think I'm ready to jump into our first scenario, our Power Query example. So I guess a little bit of background of the scenario that we're going to be looking at. Um, we've been tasked was we need to scrape, clean and transform data from multiple web pages. Uh, and we're going to start the scenario by connecting just to a single web page. We're going to, you know, scrape data, we're going to clean it up, we're going to transform it. Uh, and once we've connected to that single page, we're going to convert that transformation logic into a function. And the reason we're going to do this is because then we can take that function and we can apply it to all of the other web pages that we need to, to scrape and clean and transform. Uh, and just before I jump into Power BI, just two points um, to keep in mind as we go through. So which Power Query function should we use to connect to a web page and, and why? And then also, how do we ensure that the transformation steps that we define make sense for all of the web pages that we're going to go through? These these were two of the more challenging elements of, of building the solution, uh, and those are two that I just want to highlight before we jump into uh, before we jump into Power BI. But with that enough enough slides, enough talking, let's just jump into Power BI here. Um, and actually, let's jump into our web page. So I said we're going to scrape data from a web page, uh, and this is, this is the actual web page. So um, it's on Wikipedia. It's a list of postal codes in Canada, but only for British Columbia. Um, so we can see that we have this table here of 193 FSAs. So FSA stands for Forward Sortation Area, and these are the first three characters of the six character postal code in Canada. Uh, so if I scroll a little bit further down this page, we see we have this urban um, table here that we have the FSA, we have the city underneath, and then we have some additional uh, description around the city as well, particularly for those cities that are a little bit larger and may have multiple forward sortation areas within them. And um, we can see some of the smaller cities might only have one FSA like Penticton or White Rock, but some like Vancouver, can have multiple, right? We can see we have like the Strathcona Chinatown part of Vancouver, Northeast Vancouver, the waterfront, uh, Southeast Vancouver, et cetera. Uh, and, and the structure of our table is we see we have, it's kind of in like a matrix format, I guess. We have multiple columns that contain all of the same information and multiple rows within those columns as well. Um, 
And underneath, we also have this rural table um, for, for more rural areas of British Columbia. Um, we're not going to be looking at this rural table just yet, but it's important to keep this structure in mind as we go through the example. Um, we will be focusing on this urban part though. So, so as I say, this is the web page that we're going to connect to first, and this is the data that we want to clean up. So I'm just going to copy this URL. And if we head back into our blank Power BI report, I'm going to go to get data um, just from the big button on the ribbon here and get data from web. And I'll paste in the URL and hit OK. Just drag this navigator down here a little bit. Um, so when, when we connect to, a, to web data using a URL within Power BI, we have these options um, that are populated for us. So we have some HTML tables have been recognized on that web page. We have some suggested tables and just some text, some HTML code and displayed text as well. Um, so I've already said that we want to connect to this urban table. And if I just select, click on this from the drop down, we can see that this is the information that we saw on the web page. If I click on the web view, we can see this is that urban table. This is exactly what we've been looking at. So I'm just going to select just this table and I'll hit transform data. And once I do that, that brings us into the Power Query editor here. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, and, and just when we select that urban table, I, when I look at the applied steps on the right hand side of the page, we already have three applied steps created automatically for us. Um, we've recognized the, the types of each of the columns, and I'm actually going to delete that step. But we have an extracted table from HTML step and a source step as well. So, so within this extracted table from HTML, we can see we're using the HTML table function. And we're defining our columns in some way. We have you know, column one, I see column two, column three here. And it looks like we're you know, getting into the HTML code somehow. Like I'm not really sure what's going on and how we're defining these things. So if I click back into the previous step, our source step, we can see that in the preview of what's going on, we just have what looks to me like a lot of HTML code that is used to create that web page. And this doesn't really mean anything to me. And it's like, it's actually quite long. There's quite a big scroll bar. There's lots of stuff going on. And I really have no idea, no idea what's happening. When we extract it, and this is done automatically for us, it looks clean. But the combination of this extracted table step and this source step is really messy for me. And this is a little bit worrying because I know that if I have to maintain this or I have to explain this to someone else, I don't want to say like, you know, just kind of magic happens at this point and Power BI does good stuff automatically for us. I want to have a better idea of what's going on. So I'm going to delete this extract table from HTML step. And we have a few different options of functions that we can use to retrieve web data into Power Query. One of them is web.page. Um, and when I use this function, this takes HTML as an input and it returns a table into Power Query. Um, and this table contains some metadata and then some additional HTML information as well. So this structure is nice, but there's still not a lot of information for us to do anything with um, at this point. Like I could drill down into this table and then drill down further and further, but, but I'm not going to do that. Um, we can use a different web function, web.contents. Uh, and when I, when I change that, we see some other things happen automatically as well. Um, I just defined web contents, but it's automatically wrapped in an HTML table function. Uh, and the reason for this is because web contents just returns a binary object and it needs interpretation. Uh, and so by default, it's wrapped with this HTML.table function, but we can actually change this. Um, so I'm going to delete this change type step. And rather than HTML.table, 
I'm going to use the web.page function. And I'm going to remove this second argument. And now when I do that, I have a source step that just that just returns a something more familiar to us. It's like a table, a preview table in Power Query. We can see we have some metadata. We can see that we have like the urban table from this URL, the rural table from the URL. Um, and then we can see what data type it is. We can see we have tables. And if we click into the preview just in this data column, we can see that this is the data that we're after. We have the rural table here, but the urban table here is what we want. So if I drill into, um, let's just delete that step. If I drill into the um, the zero, the index zero row of the table, so the first row of the table, and I just want to expand all of the information in that data column. Now, when I click our source step and our navigation step, it's much more clear to me exactly what's going on. And I feel like I'd be able to explain this to other people in my team, and it would be easier for me to troubleshoot this as well. Um, so, so now we have all this data. It's in this great big matrix format. And OK, how do we clean it up? And the first thing I'm going to do uh, was actually inspired from one of, uh, one of Ken's recipe cards. And I don't remember the exact name of the recipe. I think it was unpivoting stacked data or something similar to that. Um, Ken, please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Sounds but, uh, like the right one. Sounds like the right one. Cool. Um, but essentially what we want to do is we want to add an index column onto the end of our data here. Um, so, so all I've done is that for every row in our data set, we now have just a new index column. And I'm going to right click on that index column and I want to unpivot our other columns. So now where we had a bunch of different columns and a bunch of different rows, now we have an index column that just has our index, an attribute column that are just those column names that don't really mean anything. And now I have one column that contains all of our information. So I can delete these two columns. I'm going to remove them because we don't need them. And now I need to start cleaning up this single column of data. OK, so if I click in just one of these rows to get to like a specific cell, we see that we have some data within a row stacked on top of each other. We have that FSA, the city, and then a description underneath it. Uh, and same thing in row four here. We have that pattern of FSA, city, uh, and further description. And the reason why these are separated is because there's actually a line break in between this, uh, in between those three values. And we want to get rid of that because if everything's just on the same line within the row, it's gonna be easier for us to, to separate some of these things out and transform our data. So I'm going to select this value column and from the transform tab on the ribbon from format, I'm going to hit clean because what this clean function does is it removes all non printable characters from the columns and a line break is a non printing character. And once I do that, we see that we have all of the information just on a single line in our in our uh, column now. And this is going to make it a little bit easier to work with. So if I hit the drop down or even just scrolling down that column, we can see that we have a pattern um, for all of all of the rows in our data set. We have our FSA are the first three characters, and then the city and the description and all the other stuff um, is after those first three characters. So the first split that I can do on this column, uh, I can select this value column, split by number of characters, and I want to split by three characters, not repeatedly, just once as far left as possible. So on the first three characters, which are the FSA in one column and everything else in another column. I'm going to delete that change type step. We see split column by position. I'm going to rename this to FSA. And let's rename this to location. OK. All right. So now we have a clean FSA column, and this is good. Just do a quick inspection there. Everything looks nice. But now we have a location column. And we want to split this into 
a city and then into a further description that some but not all of the FSAs have. And this is when it starts to get a little bit tricky because we don't have a fixed number of characters that we can split this column by. And we also don't have a delimiter to split by e either. Like we don't have a colon or a pipe character or a space or anything like that that we can rely on for every single row in our data. But if I look at row four, we can see that we have Surrey and then Southwest um, is immediately after. And if I go to row seven, we can see Richmond South and in row 10, Vernon East. And we can see it's kind of in like snake case right now where we or um, uh, camel case rather, where we have the first letter of each word is capitalized, but there's no space in between it. And so a cool function that we can use to split this column based on that pattern is the split from lowercase to uppercase. And what this what this um, split text by character transition function does is we there's two arguments. We search within a string for all of the values from lowercase a to lowercase z. And we see when there we see within the string when those values are immediately preceded by a capital any capital letter, so any capital letter from A to Z, and then that's where we want to split the column. So we can see that this is helped in row four. We have Surrey and Southwest, Richmond and South, Vernon and East, and we have correctly um, split the column at that point. And I'm just going to rename these two items so we know what we're doing to city and description. Okay. So, so this has worked for most or at least some of the description, but we can see that a common occurrence like in row five is this description is surrounded by um, brackets or, or parentheses. And we don't have a Burnaby straight into capital G government road. We have Burnaby and then it's immediately um, has a opening parentheses. So, so what we can do is rather than try and split this again and then do some sort of merge on description, we can actually just update this code that was done by default for us, this split text by character transition. Uh, and right now we're just looking for all instances of lowercase letters and where it then transitions to uppercase letters. But we can actually add additional items within these um, braces. These swirly braces indicate a list in Power Query. And I can say, don't just look for when a lowercase letter transitions to an uppercase letter. Look for where it transitions to an opening parentheses. And when I do that, now we can see that we have that additional information in the description as well. We see that that government road um, description for Burnaby's there, Strathcona in Vancouver. Uh, and when I scroll down city, the city, all the rows in the city column, well, it looks pretty good the first 40 something rows, but then we get to North Vancouver and we can see that it didn't split this into the description. Uh, and when I click on that, we can see the reason is because there's a space in between North Vancouver and then the opening bracket for district municipality. Now, this is an instance where it's important to understand the data that you're working with, because I know that North Vancouver district municipality is actually a valid city name. North Vancouver has North Vancouver City, the city of North Vancouver, but there's also the district municipality of North Vancouver as well. And if I scroll down a little bit further, we can see we have North Vancouver City here. So we don't want to split this, this um, information within the parentheses to the description column, but what we do want to split to the description column is this information that comes immediately after this um, closing parentheses, this inner east and east central. So once again, we can update this splitter text by character transition code. Um, and rather than just searching for when lowercase letters transition to capital or an opening bracket, we can also add we want to search for lowercase letters or closing parentheses when they transition immediately to uppercase letters or opening parentheses. 
And this pattern was only possible because we removed those line breaks from that stack data within individual rows. And we can rely on that pattern to split the data this way using this function. Uh, so when I update that now to include uh, a closing bracket in the first character transition and a close or a closing bracket rather and an opening parentheses in the second character argument of the character transition. Now when we scroll down to North Vancouver District Municipality um, or North Vancouver City, this information um, is looking clean and we have all the information in the description column. So so this is this is starting to look good. Um, just a couple last steps to to clean up. Within this city column, I just want to format and make sure every word is capitalized. And that's just so it just covers our bases for when we if we want to use city column in like a slicer in our report or we start bringing in information. Um, it's just we get a nice reliable standard formatting of all the text. Uh, and the other thing that I'm going to do is I noticed that in this row, in row 58, we have a city that is not assigned. Um, and that just means to me that this, F this FSA, this forward sortation area, hasn't been assigned to a city yet. We don't want that in our analysis. So from the drop down, I can do a quick scan just to make sure all of these cities are valid. Um, and this not assigned, I just want to filter out. We'll check all of them just to be sure. It looks good, but we'll just filter out this not assigned and I'll hit OK. Uh, so at this point, now we have a nice, clean uh, data set that we've transformed from quite a messy format in the web. And now we have a nice, clean version that we can load to a report. But we're only part of the way there because we want to convert this logic into a function so that we can now we can then apply all of this complicated logic that we defined to retrieve the forward sortation areas for all of the other provinces and territories in Canada as well. So to convert anything into a function, the first thing that we should be considering is having a parameter within this transformation logic. We don't have a parameter right now, but we're going to need to add one in. And to see exactly what parameter we're going to add in, I'm just going to jump back to the web page. Uh, and I'll go to a related web page, um, which is another Wikipedia page, which is Postal Codes in Canada. Uh, and if I scroll down a little bit and expand a table here, we can see that we have a list, um, a list or actually a table within the web page, hopefully, of all of the provinces and territories in Canada that correspond to this map just underneath. And we can see that in BC, all of our forward sortation areas start with the letter V. In Alberta, they start with the letter T. And if we go through this table here, we can see that first character of the forward sortation area for each province. Uh, some of the bigger province provinces like Ontario have multiple letters that start their forward sortation areas, Quebec as well. Uh, and some territories, like none of it in the Northwest Territories, have an X shared between them. And um, actually aren't enough. Um, I guess the population isn't big enough to have multiple forward sortation areas or even a unique starting letter in those territories. So if I go back to our original page here, our web page, the URL that we copied says list of postal codes of Canada colon underscore V. And if I go back to our table, I can actually navigate to this web page from this source table here. And if I check out Alberta by clicking the T, this source URL is exactly the same except for that last letter, T. And if we look, this urban table is in the exact same format. Uh, and just for one more, if I go to Manitoba, which is R, again, the exact same URL. We have a table in the same format. The only thing that changes is this letter. So when it comes to parameterizing our transformation logic to try and bring in all of these different forward sortation areas, 
the the only thing that's going to change in our transformation logic is that last letter of our source URL. So if I jump back into uh, Power BI here, into the Power Query Editor, I'm going to create a new parameter. It's going to be called URL. Uh, we just want a text value, and the current value is that capital V. Uh, and if we look at this FSA column, all of the forward sortation areas in British Columbia start with a V. I'm going to go back to our source step, and I'm going to delete the V from the end of that URL string. And then I'm going to take everything except for that, that last letter in the URL string, end the string there, but then I'm going to concatenate that with the current value from our URL parameter. And when I do this, nothing should change because it has a current value of V. But if I go into this parameter and update it to T, which was for Alberta, now when I go back into that query, we can see that we have all the forward sortation areas for Alberta, like Medicine Hat, Calgary, Edmonton. And it looks like we have a nice clean data set there as well. So I'm just going to set that back to British Columbia here. So now what I need to do is I don't just want to go in and manually update this parameter. I want to have a list of all of these letters, all of these letters, where I want to add this onto the end of that URL string and then run my transformation logic to retrieve that table from that web page. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to connect to this web page and retrieve this table that we've been looking at, and I'm going to bring this into the Power Query Editor. So let's copy paste this URL. And I'm going to have a another new web source. Paste the URL in there, hit OK. And this brings up the same uh, navigator pane as we looked at before. Uh, if you click on table one, this doesn't really look like what we're after. But if I look at table two, this, this looks like what we were looking at on that web page. We see we have a bunch of columns. In the first row, we have the abbreviation for the province or territory in Canada. And in the row immediately under, underneath it, it is that first letter of the forward sortation area that corresponds to the URL page that we want to bring in. So I'm going to connect to this table and hit OK. Uh, let's delete that change type step. And now I need to transform this need to transform this data into something that we can use. Um, so at this point, I can use a function that I don't actually get to use very much, but I think is is pretty cool. Uh, it's the transpose function. And so what transpose does is that it takes our data and it essentially flips it 90 degrees so that all of the information that were in our columns becomes the information in our rows. So we went from a table that had 18 columns and two rows. Now we have a table with two columns and 18 rows. Um, we see that we have that province and territory abbreviation, that first URL. And so now I just need to rename these. So province, territory, URL, and let's change the data type. So we'll change type to text. Cool. And let's call this FSA. So now we have a list of our provinces and territories, the list of the URL that we want as input into this query. Uh, but we still need to convert this query into a function. And to do that, it's as simple as right clicking on the query and selecting create function. So we need to give our function a name. Underneath, we see that our function has one parameter, which is that URL parameter we defined. So I'm going to name this fn get fsa and hit OK. And now in, the, and now in our uh, query section within the editor, we have a new folder for our function. We have the query that our function was based off of, the parameter that's within the within the function, 
and then the function here itself. If I click back into our list of FSAs, now what we can do is within this table, within this table, within this query, I can go to add a column and I want to invoke a custom function. Uh, and from the drop down, I can pick which function that I want to invoke. I want to invoke um, our fn get FSA. And then we need to select which column from this query we want to be the parameter for our function. So that's our URL. I'm going to hit OK. And now we have a table in each row. And if I just click on the preview here, we can see that we have that table of clean FSA data. So I'm going to expand. I want to return the FSA, the city, and the description for all of for for all of the provinces, and hit OK. Uh, at this point, I can delete the URL because we're not going to need it, and I'll set the data types of the remaining columns to text. Um. So, so one thing I noticed just in the first 35 rows or so here. Um, is that some of the values in the city column, we see reserved um, pop up quite a bit. And this corresponds to a description of internal testing. So this didn't occur within that British Columbia page, but it did occur in some of the other provinces. So this is why it's important that we need to also check our data after we've done this, um, running our invoking our custom function and aggregating all this data together. Um, so either here in, in the drop down for, um, for our FSA query, but I could also update the filter um, within our function itself. And in fact, why don't I do that? Where city is not assigned, and I'll also say, and city does not equal reserved. So by updating this query, our function gets updated automatically too. And then when I check back into our FSA query, we don't have those uh, reserved rows anymore, which is nice. They've just been filtered out. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit further though, we, we, we do get something else happening. For this C0A, we get repeating rows um, in our in our query, which which is no good. Again, this didn't happen in that British Columbia page, but it's happening for some of the other provinces and territories. And when we cleaned it up in British Columbia, we assumed that the same transformation logic would apply exactly the same to all of the other web pages as well. But we can see that's not exactly the case. So back into our original query. I'm just going to take our whole table and I'm just going to say remove duplicates. And if I go back into our into our final query that will land again, we can see that this C0A and C0B now have clean forward sortation areas. The city isn't exactly in the format that we want, but the forward sortation area, which was which is really what we were after looks like it's clean. So at this point, I'm ready to close and load this information, um, and then we can start building a report off of it. Uh, and in fact, if I'm just going to pull this up, this was a report that I'd built previously using that exact same information that we just looked at. Um, if I look at the map visual here, we are just plotting that FSA column on the location. We can see that unfortunately it's not perfect. We're plotting one of the FSAs from New Brunswick in the United Kingdom. Um, but if I just filter down to, uh, let's just go to BC, we can start to see now we have a list of different cities and FSAs and their description within BC. Um, and if I put drill down on within this uh, bar chart in the top left hand corner, if we just look at Vancouver, for example, now we can see all of the forward sortation areas in Vancouver with their description and where it appears on the map here. So if we cared about um, like central Kitsilano, for example, we can now click on this table and we can see exactly where that's plotted on the map.
Uh, cool. So that was the the first example for for the mixtape. Uh, and I'm just going to close out this example report. Don't say. Um, and Ken, I'm not looking at the chat, but have any questions come in as I, as we've been going through? Uh, the only question that really came in related to this stuff was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to scroll back and find it because there's a lot of chatter on uh, on unrelated things. But um, sure. but uh, there was a comment from Nick, and where the heck did it go, Nick? On um, in the FSA cleanup, why couldn't you have split by the line feed using a, a hash LF? Yeah, that yeah, uh, that is a great question. I haven't tried that recently. I believe when I originally pulled this together, that wasn't possible. But having said that, I we could. I really want to try that out, and but I'm not going to derail things <laughs> just at the moment. But um, I would say, yeah, that is definitely something that I think could work, and I'm really keen to try that now. For uh, just for reference on uh, on those, I think that those actually came out in day one of Power Query, but they were never exposed in the user interface. So you had to uh, you had to code them um, the hard way. And in my experience, the challenge with using line feed there there is now a special characters you can use, but you yeah. have to be careful because um, sometimes it's a line feed, sometimes it's a carriage return, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's both. And you gotta got to test it. it with the data set to figure out exactly which one you actually need. So. Got it. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's a great point. And the and the um, clean function that I use removes all of those things across the board as well. Different ways. Yes, exactly. Uh, cool. Okay. If if there's no questions, I can safely close the example file then. Um, I think you're good to go. Cool. I just didn't want to close it before uh, <laughs> before having to jump back in. Well, let's close some of this stuff down. All right, so so th yeah, we just went through the Power Query scenario. A couple of takeaways. Um, we need to balance how good is good enough when applying logic to multiple sources that are almost identical. Um, we saw at the end there that for some of the provinces and territories, their web pages weren't exactly the same as the British Columbia one. But if we can get the information, which in our case was a clean FSA out of it, even if the description isn't exactly what we wanted, sometimes by trying to clean up that description, and in fact, in this example, by cleaning up that description, it breaks things for other provinces. So it's always something to keep in mind that ideally when we're combining you know, files from multiple sources or we're invoking the same function on multiple things, we want all of those sources or like all of those web pages or all of those files to be um, to be in the identical format and structure, but that's not always going to be the case. Um, but by using these techniques, we can get close enough, I would say, if we can balance um, and focus on exactly what we need from, um, from our transformation. Um, we're always able to update or enhance the default behavior of Power Query functions. So, so just like using that um, text transition splitter function from lowercase to uppercase, it got us like 50% of the way there or 60% of the way there, um, but it didn't get us all of the way there. But rather than starting again and writing something from scratch maybe that completely meets our needs, we can just update that default behavior of that function, and now it does everything that we need it to do, and I don't need to write it entirely myself. Uh, and then the final thing, uh, be careful relying too much on web data. I built a dynamic solution there when I referenced like a web page that had you know, an HTML table that had all of the URLs, and then we could import uh, or concatenate that character onto a URL string. Um, it makes for a fun example to go through, and you know, everything is dynamic. And if we control the web page that we're, that we're referring to, that's great. Um, but just be careful relying on some of these things, particularly in production, as uh, if someone else owns a web page, it can change and the dynamic solutions can break. Uh, so it is something to be aware of. Uh, but with that, let's move on to the second example, uh, which is our data model example. So our scenario here is we have a report with data from a source accounting system. 
Uh, and we've been given additional information. So as always, change the requirements. Uh, we've been given additional information to include in our report that is a different granularity than this original source system. Um, so as we go through this example, a couple of things to keep in mind as we go through. Um, how should we model the combination of data for the report? Like we already have, um, we already have a data model based on our source accounting system, but now we have additional information to incorporate. And what's the best way to include this within the report and within our data model? Uh, and, and then the second point to keep in mind, how do we ensure that our solution is, is obviously correct, but how can we simultaneously prioritize keeping it easy or at least easy-ish um, to audit and update for us as analysts? We want the solution to be correct and we want to report the correct numbers for the users of the report, but we also need to be mindful as we're modeling our data. How do we keep it easy for us as well? Uh, so with that, let's jump into our second example. So we have a, a simple, just three visual report here, and I'll go over each of these visuals in one second let's just have a look at our really simple data model. So we just have two tables. We have a source, a GL source table, where we have one measure, um, GL source total. Let's make this a bit bigger. And we're just summing the balance column from this table. We have a GL foreign key that relates to a categories dimension table, uh, and we have a date as well. Um, but really, for all intents and purposes, from our source table, from our GL source system, we have one measure that just sums up the balance of those GLs. And based on that uh, general ledger account number, that GL number, we have a relationship to a category table that has the mapping for the GL of how we want to present it. So we have the GL itself, which is the primary key of this table, and then the category and the heading for that categorization hierarchy. Uh, and if I go back to this report page, we can see that at the GL granularity, so this is sort of the at the most granular that our report goes, our GL number, we have 10 of them. And when we just plot the balance, we see that we have some positive balances and some negative balances from our GLs. Uh, and if we look at the visual to the top right of our report, we can see that this corresponds to these GLs being mapped to a category and a heading of revenue. So for positive balances and negative balances are our operating expenses, our depreciation, our interest and our taxes, anything that we're subtracting from that revenue. Uh, and down here at the in the bottom right hand corner, it's the, the uh, most coarse grain um, in our categorization table, our heading. Um, this does appear in the table above as well, next to this category, but we can see just that aggregation at the heading level. We have our total revenue. We can see each of these um, expenses or depreciation or interest coming off, and then we're left with our total, which would be our net profit or our gross profit based on these line items. Okay. Uh, and if I open up the Power Query Editor, we can see that we have two additional queries to bring in um, that I've already imported. And in reality, the structure wasn't this nice and clean. It did take some manipulation to get to this point, but we're skimming over the fun Power Query transformation part in this example. Uh, but we can see that similar to our um, GL source table, where we have a GL, a date, and a balance, we have a list of uh, we have a list of values that we want to remap. So we can see that we have in the GL column values one, two, three, one, two, three, and then we have net one, net two, net three, net one, net two, and net three. Uh, and if we look at the very first row, we have a value of negative 55 that corresponds to a, the GL number of one. And in row seven, for the same date, for the GL value of net one, we have a value of positive 55. 
So the reason why these offsetting values appear twice is within this remapping information, what we want to do is we want to subtract 55 from GL1, and we want to add that instead to a new GL net one. And the, and the reason why it needs to appear twice is because if we just had um, these new six rows here at the bottom, these we're introducing new GLs and we say, okay, we want these to be the balances of these accounts, then we would be overstating our financial position by $55 or $25 or $40. So we're not introducing new balances, we're just remapping and reallocating these balances to different line items. So that's why we need to have um, a negative value as well as a positive value within this remapping table. So as well as remapping, we also have balances to remove. Uh, and, and this is a pretty common scenario that, you know, we may have one team in our organization that posts in our, uh, that posts in our accounting system, but the accounting system doesn't account for everything that goes on. And there's some other stuff that someone runs either on the side of their desk or maybe in like their FP&A system or, the, or there's some other source system that we want to include for our report. And we're going to say, look, our accounting system may say this, but we're actually overstating the balances of these accounts. So we need to remove just this amount. So there's no offsetting. We're not remapping these balances. We actually want to change the, the balances, change the amount that's in the GLs from our source system. So I'm going to enable load for both remove and remapping. And I'm going to hit close and load. Okay. So if I go back into our model view, we see that I have um, the relationship automatic relationship detection on, so that makes my life easy. Uh, and where we previously had just one fact table and one uh, dimension table, now we have three fact tables. We have GL source, remap, and remove. And we have a one-to-many relationship from each of them and um, between a GL foreign key on the fact table and the primary key on the categories dimension table. So as a best practice, I'm just going to hide the key on the many side of the relationship. Uh, and I'm also going to hide the date column for now. Um, it would definitely be expected that we'd also have a date dimension that we could relate to each of these fields as well. We're not going to get into that for this example, but we could have many different dimension tables as well. We'll just leave it there for now. Uh, now we have GL source, which has our GL source total that's in all of these visuals as well. And we have re remap and remove queries. So if I drop remap balance into our visual here, and the remove balance into our visual as well. We can see that we have some different colored bars in our bar chart. So we have all of the same GL source total. But now we see for our remap balance, we see negative balances in GL1, GL2, and GL3. And then we have a great big bar that's blank. It's mapping to a blank GL. OK. Uh, and then for our remove balance, this green value, we see we have a small negative value that are mapping correctly to GLs1 and GL2. So, so we've introduced this additional information, but now we're getting this blank value. And this isn't going to be good if we add this remap balance, for example, to this table. We have a blank row here. And that doesn't really help us when it comes to eventually adding these balances to see our financial position at the heading level or even at this category level. Blank rows um, aren't good. So we need to go back into the Power Query Editor. And if we look at our categories table, the reason we're getting blank values, and um, let's make this a bit bigger again. The reason we're getting blank values is if we remember 
these balances are being attributed to GLs called net one, net two, net three. In our categories dimension table, these values don't exist. So we need to add these onto our categories dimension table to be ordered to properly allocate and net out remap these values. So I'm just going to change the navigation step of the query and with a little bit of a sleight of hand, uh, let's delete that change type step, with a little bit of a sleight of hand, now we have all of the GLs that we need, one, two, and three. Um, you may need to use some different methods to update a mapping table. Some things uh, that I've done in the past is rather than rely on a table from a source solution, you can actually have your own maintained manually as an Excel table. That scales well to a certain point, or otherwise you can um, programmatically add some GLs in as well. Lots of different ways to maintain this, um, to maintain a categories dimension to ensure that you have the mapping for all of the GLs from all of your fact tables. And we'll talk about that um, in, in just a moment as well. But I'm going to hit close and apply at this point. And when I do that, if we look at our bar chart to the left here, now we see that these balances are being correctly remapped. We're taking a balance away from GL1 with this gold bar, and now we're mapping it to a new GL net one. And we're taking it away from three, away from two, and now we're adding that onto new GLs as well. At this point, rather than relying on implicit measures, let's create some new measures for these tables to make them true fact tables. So let's call this remap total. And let's make this bigger once again. And we want to sum our remap balance. And now we can hide the original field and we'll do the same thing for the remove table. We can create a new measure. And we'll call this remove total sum remove balance. And we can hide that base uh, column. So now we have three fact tables that we can see. We have one dimension table that they're all properly related to. And on this categories level, if I add remap total and remove total, and let's change remove to a whole number, and the remove total, now we can really see clearly the breakdown of how things are being allocated. From our source system, we can see what the allocation is. We can see how things are remapping um, based on the information that we've got to um, change the allocation from our source system. And we can really clearly see the balances that we want to remove from the GLs within our source system as well. Uh, and on our very first fact table, I can create our final measure. Maybe we can call it like current total. And we can sum up these three totals. We can see our GL source total, our remap total, and our, oh, can't type, remove total. And when we hand this report to someone else or we have to update it or we have to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with it, now it's really obvious that this current total, we're summing our GL source, our remapping, and our removing. And if I add this to be the final column in our uh, category table in the top right-hand corner of our report, we can see that we're doing the math correctly across the board. And all users are going to see is this current total. And I'll update this waterfall chart at the bottom with our current total. So all users are going to see is this current total, but we've structured our data model and our DAX measures in such a way that 
when we get questions from our finance department or from our treasury department or from our CFO or from whoever, we can see exactly as because we've separated into multiple fact tables, we can see exactly where balances are coming from, how we're getting to our current total. It's all nicely, neatly separated using very simple DAX measures and using a simple data model as well. Uh, so if I go back into the slides here, takeaways from this example, you know, we could have merged source, remap and remove queries into a single fact table in the Power Query Editor. So instead of having multiple fact tables, we could have like appended all of these into one table. But having these three separate fact tables in the data model makes it easier for us to see the underlying calculation of that current total measure. And the downsides of this downside of this method is we have to manage multiple relationships to dimension tables. Uh, and we also have to maintain a mapping dimension like that categories query. We have to maintain that table for all of our fact tables. So a little bit different than the standard star schema, but by getting away from that standard, some things are easier and some things are made more difficult. And really it's just about right sizing and um, right sizing the solution. Again, keeping in mind the correct answer as well as how easy it is to, to audit and maintain um, and be able to explain to others. Uh, at this point, I'm ready to move on to the final example of the evening, but I just want to check in if there's any questions in the chat, Ken. Uh, Sorry, man. Uh, Some something okay. popped up right in front of my screen and blocked me from getting to the Teams window. Uh, window. Uh, <laughs> no, there are no questions in the chat. Okay. You are good to go forward. <laughs> sounds sounds good. Thank you. All right, last example of the evening, focusing more heavily on the DAX aspect now. So let's have a look at our scenario. So we have a report based on a standard and simple star schema. We have a product dimension that filters the fact table of our report, and we want to add the ability to our report to return all of the products from the same category as the filtered product. So again, a couple of things to keep in mind when we go through this scenario, where can we add relationships to the data model? And how can we retain the ability to still filter to a single product? We want to add the ability to return all of the products from the same category, but we also want to still retain the ability to still thing, uh, filter to a single product. Uh, let's close this Power BI report. And we can jump into the last one of the evening. So let's just review our report as it currently is. It's powered by this filter um, on our filters pane. We filter for a specific product like athletic fit. So we can see we're displaying athletic fit. This product belongs to the product category of jeans. And we can see some of the total income for this product by location, the total cost for this product by location. And then we are also mapping the total cost and total revenue of this product on a scatter chart. Uh, and when we filter through some of the different options here in the product filter, the product updates, the product category uh, that the product belongs to updates, as well as all of our visuals, as you would expect. But what we want to do is when we filter to a specific product, like a button up shirt, we don't just want to look at information just for the button up. We want to look at the information for all of the products that belong to the same product category. So a button up is a type of shirt. We actually want to see all of the other income cost revenue information for all of the products that belong to the product category of shirts. OK, so how can we do this? Let's head to the data model. So right now we have a, as I said, simple and it's the simplified star schema model, a single fact table. We have a uh, location dimension table for location, dim location which has a one to many relationship to location on the fact table. So we can use location to slice the total cost, total income and total revenue facts. Uh, and then we have the same thing currently on our product dimension. 
we have a one to many relationship from our dimension to our fact table and we're using this to slice um, these facts of our fact table. But somehow we want to be able to to slice our data and return all of the products for the same product category. So a solution for this is we can create our uh, another dimension table, a dim category table. And we can we can do this in the Power Query editor for sure. We can definitely do that, but I'm going to do a calculated table in DAX. So let's make the formula bar a little bit bigger. We can call our table dim category. And I just want to return all of the distinct values of product category from our dim product table. So I can define our table just like this. We're just going to have one column. Again, it's just all the distinct categories from our product table. And once I build that, we can go to the data view and it looks like this. We have those jeans, pants, shorts, shirts, um, et cetera, all of those items at the um, one level above in our product hierarchy. So now what we can do is we can make our relationship to our fact table, just like we have done with our other dimensions. We have a one-to-many relationship. But what we can do as well is since we have product category on our product dimension, we can create a relationship this way too. And when we do that, we see that because there are many, many categories on our um, product dimension, because it's at the product granularity, and we only have distinct categories on our dim category table, um, we have a one-to-many relationship here. Uh, and it's actually an inactive relationship as well. So there's a few things that I want to change about our data model. And it's going to go against some best practices, but it will allow us to get to our solution. So the first thing I want to do is I want to change the cross filter direction of this relationship from single to both. And I'll apply that change. So now the arrow, typically it goes only from the one to the many side of the relationship. If we look at the arrow for all of these one to many relationships, the arrow usually only goes towards the many side. We've changed this so that we can filter both ways between the table. Then I'm going to look at the relationship, the existing relationship between our product and our fact table. And I want to make this relationship inactive. And the reason I'm doing that is so I can make this new relationship between our two dimension tables active. Cannot have security field set to both direction relationship is not set to active. OK, let's change this back to single. And then let's make it active. And then let's make it both. OK, there we go. So now we have an active bi-directional filter relationship between two category tables. We have a one-to-many relationship between our category and our fact table. And we have an inactive one-to-many relationship between our product and our fact table. So let's go back into our report. And holy cow, things have changed. All of this, all of these numbers have gone shooting up from the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands maybe into the millions. And now, even though we have just a single product filtered on our filter pane here, we're returning multiple values. And if we see we have athletic fit, regular, slim, skinny, these seem to all correspond to the product category of genes. We're only selecting athletic fit but we see that we're returning multiple products that all belong to the genes category. And depending on what we filter and select, we see that we're returning all of the information for all of the similar products. And the reason why we were able to do this is because rather than just filtering product to product, we're actually using our product filter. We have to follow the filter trail to our fact table. So we're selecting a specific product, but we're filtering our product dimension. So we're filtering to a single product and it's associated single product category. That single product category 
goes to our product dimension and selects a single product category. Then we go to our fact table and it's on this product category that we are returning. And when I look in the visual here, we're using product from our fact table to populate the unique items in this scatter plot. Uh, in the scatter plot. So although we're selecting just athletic pants, on our fact table, we have multiple products selected because it's not the product field that's filtering our fact table. Our product field is filtering our category, and then it's our category table that's filtering our fact table. So right now we're using our product filter to essentially just filter by product category. But one of the things we said in this scenario is we want to retain the ability to get that same product level information as well. And so what we can do is we can create some new DAX measures for that. So let's make the formula bar a bit bigger again. So let's create a new measure called product total income. And we'll use the calculate function on our total income measure. And we're going to use the use relationship function. And so we have an inactive relationship still between our product dimension and our fact table. And we can specify that we want to use specifically that relationship when calculating this measure. So from our dim product, we're going to use product. And from our fact table, we're going to use product. And now I can drop this measure onto our chart here. And let's format this as a currency. And now we can see that we have the context of the income for a, for a specific product. And then we can see the total income for all of the categories in that product as well. And we can do the same thing with total cost. I'm going to create a new measure and we'll call this product total cost. And once again, we want to calculate our total cost by specifying which relationship in our data model we want to use. From our product table, we want product, and we want to filter our fact table directly on the product field. Now I can drop that into the other column chart, change that into a currency type, and now we have that context of both things. We can see the individual product level and how much that's contributing to the entire product category here. So one final, uh, one final part of this dashboard, um, really just to polish, really just to round it off, is one thing that's still a little bit confusing is we can see the, the specific product up here, athletic fit, the product category it belongs to, the individual income for the product as well as for the entire category. But when we look at the scatter plot here, we really have to pay attention to the data labels to know, oh, okay, which one is the product that we're filtered to. And it would be nice as if that we could just see at a glance which specific product is the one we've filtered to in comparison to all of the other products within the same category. And this is where we're going to come back to our conditional formatting, and I'm going to create a new DAX measure to power this conditional formatting. So the last measure that we'll build for this report, we're going to call this measure highlight, because we're going to use this measure to power the conditional formatting for the scatter chart, and we're going to highlight the specific product that's filtered. So we're going to use a few different variables. So the first variable, is going to be called dim. And we're going to use the values function once again to return all of the distinct values of products from our product table. Then we're going to use another variable to return all of the distinct values of product from our fact table. Then we're going to take both of these lists. There's only going to be one specific product in our dimension but there may be multiple in our fact table. 
and we want to do a comparison of these two lists. So we're going to do this using the intercept function. And we want to compare our dimension and our fact variables that we defined. Then we're going to take this comparison, this intersection, and we want to count the number of rows within this comparison. And then finally, we're going to return some conditional logic. So if our count for a specific uh, product is equal to one, we want to return, and now this is a hex code for a specific color. Uh, and then otherwise, we want to return a different, a, a different color, essentially. So we're testing distinct values in our dimension, distinct values in our fact, compare the two lists, count the rows where they intersect, and if the count is equal to one, we want to return this color, otherwise return a different color. Now I can click on our scatter chart in the visualizations pane under color. I can use this FX button again. Format style rather than rules, which we looked at in the what's new at the beginning of the evening, we can do a field value. And now we can select our highlight measure, hit OK. And now athletic fit is colored red and all the other products are colored blue. And when I filter through the different products, we can see it's really easy to see just at a glance which specific product that we have uh, we have filtered and we've selected, and which other um, which other circles on our scatter chart are there just for the comparison and just to see which other products belong to that same category there. Uh, so let's head back into our PowerPoint just to review our final takeaways. So rules are meant to be broken, as we saw when we were modeling that data. We had, you know, bi-directional filters. We were creating relationships. We were going up the many side. We were doing all sorts of things. Uh, and being flexible with best practices can sometimes help keep DAX measures or a data model more simple. Uh, but we need to be careful. I was very, you know, cavalier and a bit maverick with that first statement and coming back down to earth for the second statement here. Uh, we need to know what we're doing and we need to be careful with this. Um, in order to get the same result with a standard star schema model, potentially it's possible, but we'd have to write a really com or a more complex DAX measure, or maybe even do some more complex things in the Power Query Editor. But by being flexible with our data modeling, we can get to the same point by keeping a much more simple model and more simple DAX measures as well. However, when we do things like this, we need to consider the scalability of our data model and our solution as well. This works because I only had three um, measures on our fact table, and then to still have the ability to filter by product or by category, I only needed to rebuild three measures. If we had many, many more measures, that might not be um, the best way to do it. Uh, and with that, that's everything I had for this evening. So we started with what's new in Power BI, and then we went over three examples from uh, volume one of my Power BI mixtape. We looked at an in-depth Power Query example, we looked at a data modeling example, and then we looked at a DAX example. Uh, so thank you everybody for your time and for attending today. I know that was a lot of me talking. Um, my website and blog uh, is up there in the slides. The slides will be shared um, to the user group and they will be up on my website as well as all the example files that we went through today. Uh, my Twitter handle is there, my LinkedIn is there as well. I love connecting and and uh, and speaking with with other analysts in the community. Um, so if you have any questions or or any feedback or just wanted to chat about anything, please feel free to connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, and at this point, yeah, I guess open the open the floor up to any questions that that may be coming in or may not, and uh, or we can call it an evening. All right, um, I've just asked for confirmation on one uh, question here, but um, but outside of that, that was the only uh, sort of one out there. Um, I'll cool. give you the question anyway, Joseph, just uh, sure. just in case. Um, so uh, Morena asked if there was any way that you could use a drop down in your last example. A drop. 
uh, like a drop down slicer as opposed to on the filter pane. And Marina, if you're comfortable, if you want to unmute and, and ask the question mm -hmm. uh, for a clarification, um, the yes is the answer to that. <laughs> so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah, I was gonna say if it if it's just a, if it's just a, a question of having a filter on the actual report canvas as opposed to in the filters pane, yeah, for sure, still, still good. All right. So is that a question from you, or is that an answer from you? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's sorry. That's an answer. Yes, it 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 will work the same. There you go. All right. Awesome. Um. All right. Uh. I don't see any other questions coming in. Um. Lots of comments okay. about uh, excellent examples, and and thank you. Um. And that's where I'm going to take my cue. Uh. Bud, thanks for doing this again. I mean, um, two presentations in one night. Fantastic work. Really appreciate it. Uh, of course. Thank you for uh, for handling both of those, and always great to have you back on uh, on the stage here and uh, and doing your thing. So, um, yeah. Outside, I guess we have no other questions coming in. So I guess uh, we will wrap this up for this time around and uh, give Joseph the rest of his evening back. Thank you for coming again. Thanks everybody for uh, for showing up and uh, and supporting this. And don't forget that the RSVPs are open for the next couple of sessions uh, with Faraz and Jason. So um, we're hoping that we can see uh, lots of you there for uh, for both of those. Outside of that, we'll sign off for tonight. Thanks very much, folks. See you next time.